Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Making the Cut podcast. I'm your host, Jacob, here from Made the Cut, along with my co-host, Peyton, from Big League Analysis over on TikTok. How you doing, man? It's been a while since we recorded one of these. Yeah, man, I just graduated. I don't know how. Um, <laughs> Yankees are still good. So, oh, dude. Chilling. Um, better than anybody <laughs> I think thought they were going to be coming into this season. I, mean, I, I thought they were going to be better than some people were saying. Uh, yes. But, I mean, one of the best teams in baseball. I don't think anybody could have necessarily predicted that. Yeah, I mean, the, the funny thing about, like, the anti-Yankee sentiment coming into the year is that I think they're a guaranteed 500-team minimum, but mm-hmm. being a 500-team for the Yankees is a failure for, of a season, but for 26 other ball clubs, they'd be like, oh, that was pretty good. Yeah, you know? that's okay. So, but, like, that's the thing. They're guaranteed, like, 81 wins, but, like, after, outside of that, you never know what happens. Ball falls your way. And I think that's happening for them right now, kind of, in a way, but yeah. they're still way better than I Oh, 100%. Lucas Heal is literally, like, going yeah, to be... Yes, Luis. I think it's Luis Heal. Luis Heal, I'm sorry. Yes, Luis yeah, Heal. He had a moment. Is literally <laughs> is going to be, I think, like, a top 10 pitcher for, like, the next five years. Like, he so, has had that level of stuff for a long time now. He had some injury issues. But seeing him fully dominate, especially in uh, the absence of Garrett Hill, has been insane. But you, 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 what's, so so something, something that's what I thought out there, which is, which is really funny about uh Luis Heal is I saw him pitch for the first time in 2021 and he went on like I think his first three starts he allowed zero runs <laughs> and like he was like but like obviously the command was all over the place you yeah. know he's kind of corrected that now I remember I was like dude like this guy's gonna be like insane but then he got hurt and like you never heard a thing about him for like yes. a year and a half because he wasn't really a hyped up prospect he was kind of older mm-hmm. but like I love how like everyone now is realizing and I remember like that's like that was my guy like I'm not really I'm not the great I'm not like a guy who always like predicts talent like that but that was my guy first time I saw him two years ago I'm like he's gonna be legit he I was- remember he was on like some middling like Yankee prospect list in like 2018, 2019. I remember looking at like kind of the report and I was like, wait, he he throws a hundred mile an hour fastball and he can also <laughs> two seam it and he's got a 93 mile an hour slider and he's got other off speed pitches and he's like their 16th ranked prospect or whatever it was at the time. I was like, that sounds like I mean, I think they were saying he was gonna be a reliever or something like that. They didn't see exactly him sticking in the rotation, but I was like, man, if this guy can like do anything similar to even like Luis Severino, right? Because it sounded like he had a similar yes. repertoire. He's going to be able to be good. And it's cool exactly. to see that maturation. Exactly. Yes. 100%, so, man. Are you ready our... to get to our uh, our first does this take make the cut? Yes. 100%, man. Okay. So I got the first one. And this one's a very current take. Okay. So I got one that's a bit more meta after this, but this one's more current. The Mets overreacted. When it comes to the Jorge Lopez situation, does that take make the cut? Well, I will say this. I mean, I think everyone kind of overreacted, but I just want to say this. This is, I think this is, this is a conversation that got brought up when the whole Otani scandal broke Mm -hmm. because people saw videos of Otani speaking English and they're like, why does he need a translator? This is why guys whose English is their second language need a translator, even if. They speak good English. Jorge Lopez speaks good English. She could have a conversation with any of us. Exactly. But there's just, there's, there's, there's a little bit of disconnect. And he's a smart guy. I'm not saying he's not. He's just, he, it's just, when it's not your first language, there's going to be some issues sometimes. You're, you're not going to have the same clarity. And that's why translators are so important, even for guys who speak English. So I really want to get that out of the way. And I remember I did a little piece on it. And I'm, I remember I, I tried because I did a little piece on it before the he put put a story post. I remember I tried to yeah. show both sides. I'm like, some people are saying he said this. Other people are saying that it was the teammate thing. And it is the, if it is the teammate thing, which it is, because that's what he said. Like, um, I would say definitely overreacting to his comments. And but like I but but the Mets said that they were more upset about the glove thing and not mm-hmm. really being remorse, remorseful for it, but. Jorge Lopez has a history of kind of doing things like that. He's kind of a hothead. He's had some issues personally, and I hope he's going to deal with that. And, you know, but I remember last year it was the thing with the Gatorade. He accidentally poured Gatorade in his hair. Then he like punched the Gatorade cooler. Like he has a history <laughs> of being a bit of a hothead, but like yeah. the Mets signed him. Exactly. So he's going to so- have some moments. So, I would say, did they overreact? Sure, but like, I feel like with a when when a team is struggling that bad and they have a scandal like that, not a scandal, a controversy like that, right? I understand 
DFAing the reliever. <laughs> yeah, I, I get where you're coming from. I think it was Chris Rose that kind of had mentioned something similar to what you said, where it was more of a failure organizationally of the Mets to not give him an interpreter. I mean, I remember hearing yes. uh, once that Ichiro, you know, he, who obviously spoke very good English, mm-hmm. would always have an interpreter there just specifically to give himself more time to answer questions than maybe somebody who was a native English speaker would have. And it's smart. Mm-hmm. I mean, with the media... Any you can get into that flow essentially, especially when you're frustrated of getting asked a barrage of questions and almost saying more than you mean to say or reacting mm-hmm. emotionally. Whereas if you have a little bit more time to think about it, uh, you can give a more cogent response. I personally think it was a little bit of an overreaction on their part, just because if if there was, and we I think we agree that there was a bit of a miscommunication there in the media. I don't think it's a best the best look for your organization to be DFAing a guy over uh, misinterpreted comments. And all you can say it's about the glove, mm-hmm. but we've seen you know situations happen. Like you said, the water cooler is a great example. Guys do stuff like this, especially during a really tough time for the Mets, right? I mean, Francisco yes. Lindor had the team meeting after this game. I definitely think it's a circumstance where I could see him being placed on you know some sort of administrative leave, some sort of something that I could see him being suspended by Major League Baseball. But outright DFA'd, especially when he's been pretty decent for the Mets. Aside solid. from that he's outing, been solid, yeah, yeah. But, uh, the outing, if you take out the outing that he had yesterday, he was at around a 120 ERA plus before that. So he's been like one of their more solid relievers. So you can't really say it's like, yeah, you, you can't really say, oh, he was terrible. And then he did this. That's the last straw. It's it's more like this is really the only reason they would do that. And another thing that Chris Rose brought up that I thought was pretty telling was his uh, one of, I believe it's his uh, child is on an implant list right now. So he's under yes. a lot of stress personally. Uh, along with the stress that he's feeling on the field. So again, I'm not saying I defend the actions. Nobody should be throwing equipment, period. You know, throwing things into the crowd is just a bad look. But at the end of the day, releasing somebody like that from your organization completely and, and essentially showing that you're going to take the side almost of the controversy over the player, especially at the point that they are right now in their season, I understand no holds barred, but I do think it's a bit of an overreaction. I have one thing to add on, Mm because I think this is also an important context that neither of us mentioned so far, is I think another issue the Mets had was that he was outright, like, swearing to the media. That's a good point. And, I mean, do you DFA a guy over that? But when, I think everything bungled together, um, I do think it starts with the Mets organization. I think not not having a translator with him is absolutely, like, that's just crazy. Seriously. Like, especially after something as, especially after an event like that, where what he says is going to be news regardless. Exactly. Like, I almost go- feel like, I-, I could understand Shield How often? That. Like, how like, completely. O- how often does Jorge Lopez have that many media members in his face? Never. Never. Unless, like, I don't know. And, that, and that, that's not, and I don't mean that as an insult to him. No. He's a vi- he's a fine pitcher. I'm just saying he's not the center of attention. No, a hundred percent. Unless like he I plays said, bad. Exactly. What, that's exactly. the thing with relievers. The thing with relievers of that caliber, where you know the guys who aren't the closers, they're more like the the night, like well, like you're gonna get some key outs. Like they're only you only really focus on them when they mess up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's a thankless job. I can understand a circumstance where the Mets would shield him from that entirely. Honestly, I've always been kind of of the mindset of if a guy seems pretty unbalanced at the time that he's going to be speaking to the media, which again, the game had really, it was like the eighth inning, I believe, that that situation had occurred. The game had just ended. I would completely have understood if they were like, you know what, he's going to address the media tomorrow. They probably wanted to try it out there and actually like, you know, apologize and everything. So I can kind of understand from that perspective. But, you know, in a way, that kind of comes down to a little bit of, Who's who you on the side of, right? I mean, I think they were trying to serve their fans, but they kind of sided against their player, right? Because again, he's feeling heavily emotional at that point. Throwing your glove mm-hmm. into the crowd, when's the last time you saw that? Like that's that's a pretty rare thing to do. I not only was it a bad idea to have him go out there, the translator, but like I said, if you're gonna have him go out there without a translator, I, I at least be understanding if some things that end up being said that are maybe a little regretful, especially when again. I really do believe that he was taking responsibility just in a very immature way. I I, I don't think he was directly insulting the team or the organization or anything of that nature. Yeah. And so something else I just want to point out, because I thought it was funny, was that what were the last two Mets like contra or like things, right? It was the Jorge Lopez thing. And before us, it was the Francisco Lindor strikeout. Yeah. And 
Bryce Harper did both of those things last year. Yeah. <laughs> and no one cares. Like, the context is way different. Like, yes. struggling team versus, you know, superstar player on, like, a really good team. But, like, it's just, I thought it was just really funny. It's like, Bryce Harper did both those things last year. I'm like, wow. Like, one, like, oh, it's really cool that someone got a piece of that memorabilia. And then it was like, oh, like, he wasn't swinging. It was, like, strategic. because Right, exactly. Could... But, like, it was then with, The with, context with, like, of when... your team means a it's lot, really funny. right? I know, but it's really fun. Like, I, I, I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not like, oh, the media is biased. No, I'm just talking <laughs> about. I think it's funny how like the context of these two teams like drastically flips the narrative on oh, like the same actions. hundred percent, dude. All righty, you want to give me your uh, your take? And obviously, you know, as we've done in these previous episodes, I think that probably do one of these making the cut takes and then moving on to our yeah, really yeah. dense concept. All right, go ahead. This so this is an interesting one, and this is one I was thinking about because I saw a video. I mean, this is like something that's popular in baseball, but I saw a video recently of a high school player hitting a home run. Uh, it was a top draft pick prospect, uh, PJ Morlando. Mm -hmm. And so he crushes a home run, bat flips. And I went to the comments and everyone's talking about the bat flip, right? This is like, this This isn't anything. I'm not saying nothing groundbreaking conversation. But what I, what I was thinking of, not even in the concept of the bat flip, but just a common response people have to that is, you know, a pitcher throwing at a batter. So my take, which makes a cut, because this is something I think about all the time, and I don't understand why it's seen this way, is that pitcher, in most cases, I'll say in most cases, pitchers intentionally, intentionally, wow, pitchers intentionally throwing at batters isn't badass at all, and it's kind of soft. <laughs> like, like, but just like, I'm gonna think about this. Like, you're throwing high 90s to a person who's stationary and doesn't know. It's the equivalent of just cheap shot, cheap shotting someone, which... I think we all kind of recognize as very like low, right? In right. baseball, in baseball is kind of seen as like badass. But what, what, you, what do you think about that? You 100% <laughs> are right about that. And I, mean, here's the thing. <laughs> I, I, this, I view this um, somewhat in terms of reactionary versus being proactive, right? So a pitcher is throwing the ball. He controls where the ball is going. Yes. Some guys don't necessarily have That's that fair. control. That's but, fair. but pitchers control where the ball is going. Hitting is reactionary. You're only able to do things like crush a 440 foot dinger if the pitcher messes up in some capacity or you just straight out skill them. But regardless, hitting Bingo. is reactionary. So if you hit a 440 foot moonshot and bat flip, it's because you've done something in response to the pitcher, right? If you were to throw your bat at the pitcher, that also would be proactive, correct? Exactly. But <laughs> on top of that, so that is you're taking an aggressive action versus what you could consider kind of an aggressive reaction if you want to be soft. Now, additionally, there is no physical harm that will come to anybody as a result of a bat flip. But it's, no. it's unless you are the Asiel Puig and flip it so close to the umpire, you might clip in the head. But that's the, fair. The the only <laughs> circumstances in which a bat flip would be inappropriate from that perspective would be an extremely careless one. There's even a clip that went viral here a little while back. I believe yes, it was high school. I, I saw that. Yes. Yep. Can't be bat flipping into the umpire. That's bad. That's bad. That's Terrible. bad. However, with a pitcher, you could not only easily injure somebody. In some respect, it almost seems like an injury would be the final form of retaliation, right? It's like, you hurt yeah. my feelings. I'm going to hurt you. Not just clip you. I'm going to hurt you. So yes. yes, I think that's incredibly immature. And then additionally, I think that when we're going the other way, so we're talking about reactionary and proactive. If a pitcher strikes a guy out, right? So the, the pitch being thrown again mm -hmm. is proactive. The swing and a miss is reactive. Now he has his reactive moment to freak out and celebrate. Chase yes. Burns, right? And uh, NCAA right now is uh, you know, the best pitcher on earth, relatively speaking. He, when he strikes somebody out in a big spot, he freaks out and goes awesome. absolutely ballistic. It's awesome. <laughs> he should have the right to do that. What if in response, the next guy who came up the next inning took a swing and intentionally Manny Machado and tried to fire it at the Man. mound? Terrible. Terrible. I mean, yes, it's a bat versus a ball. However, I could argue you could throw a ball a lot harder than you can throw a bat. But still, 100% it's soft beat guys on the field. That's what you need to do. If he hit a dinger off you and you're mad... And then you strike out the side, do whatever you want. Glove flip as you're walking off the, the field. Flip your <laughs> glove into the uh, dugout. I don't know. Come up with some sort of response. Marcus Stroman, I think, is a great example of that. Whether I think so, too. I'm a big fan of him is that, you know, his response has always been, if you hit a dinger, feel free to bat flip. But then if I strike your ass out and I do a shimmy, you better not cry. 
exactly i just think i just i just thought it was so funny because like when we're talking about sports right especially you know like the the goal is to win a game yes Obvi obviously i remember obviously. This, this is a this is a fun and like if i was coaching a team and my pitcher surrendered a long ball and the first thing he thought of after he saw a guy pimp a home run off him was i'm gonna hit him with a pitch and not i'm gonna get the next guy out you know what i'm trying to say like exactly fact, like exactly I just you have your anger in the wrong place and i think that comes from an incredibly what are we doing it come, well i mean and we can talk about like the sociological implications in terms of our evolution from the time in which that was considered socially acceptable but i will just say you know i don't want to get too deeply into that because it does yeah. start skewing a bit political but i'll say this in the olden days if you were a guy and you're pitching and a guy hit homer off you and bat flipped it was acceptable to have the rage within you to blame him, to choose to take your anger out on him, not handle that anger proactively and proceed to being the next four guys or whoever you wanted to do. And everybody would defend you. Nowadays, socially, that's not considered to be acceptable, right? So I mean, handle your <laughs> channel, that energy into something productive, right? Being, yes. being this macho uh, uh, almost like pillar of masculinity to a dysfunctional degree, because again, Hey, there's one argument against that that's airtight that we can we can get around everything, which is you're giving up a free base. Yes. Just on paper, that's stupid, right? We allowed a homer, so I'm gonna put myself in a worse position by putting by the then, next guy on base. And that also comes again from the evolution of thinking on this subject, which is do you understand the expected runs of a runner on first base versus a runner not on first base? Right. We yes. understand that. And it doesn't matter in what circumstance. It can be no outs, one out, two outs. It's always going to be higher if there's man on first. So don't hit man intentionally for any reason or you put yourself in a worse situation. I'm not going to say you're not going to punch the next guy out. Maybe you will. But statistically, it's a worse situation to be in. Why would you do that to yourself intentionally, especially after just giving up something that you probably didn't want in your ledger to begin with? I pitched in high school and I was fine. I wasn't I'm not going to act like I was something insanely special but that was fun and i remember we were playing a really good team i think this kid went like he went he went to college he didn't he didn't like go pro or anything but he was a very solid ball player and i remember he hit a moon shot off me i like it was one of those pitches because you pitched off out of the hand i knew it was yeah homer like i i just <laughs> i was like i did two strike count i'm hung it like i off my hand i literally was like oh and then yeah, i knew it's over he he destroyed it like he bat flipped i was like whatever I remember after the game, like his coach, I think his coach probably did this. I don't know why he would do this. He apologized to me. I'm like, dude, you hit a, four, I'll probably hit a 450, <laughs> but you hit a moonshot off me. Like I, you did your job. I didn't do my job. Exactly, dude. <laughs> yeah, I had a similar circumstance when I was in college where, uh, you know, I ended up dropping out after the first, uh, uh, you know, little section yes. of it to pursue YouTube full time. But I was going there to be a pitcher. It was a D3 school. And the hitter that I was facing was the best hitter on the team. He's a senior. He's our catcher. And he ended up taking me like, you know, 380, 390 to right center field. Uh, in that field, it was an absolute no doubter. He crushed it. I, I don't remember if he absolutely pimped it or if it was more like he just kind of stared at it. But regardless, he definitely, you know, made it known that he thought it was a dinger. And after the practice, he ended up coming up. I think it was like a live game type practice. And he was like, oh, yeah, sorry, man. You know, if I ended up, uh, you know, showing you up, I didn't mean to. And I was like, dude, like you hit a nuke, like a nuclear <laughs> yeah. missile off of me. I don't care. Do, do whatever you want. If I strike you out next time. I'm probably going to do something in celebration, especially because you hit a nuke off me. But that's the game. It's a game, right? I think that's what it comes down to at the crux of it all. It's a game. Don't get that pressed about it. Don't put people's um, health in danger over a game. Yeah, especially especially, especially with what we've seen that hit by pitches can do. Like uh, hit by like pitches Trout last year, like ruined, it ruined yeah. a third of his year. Like we can talk about like how like guys, guys get hit in the face, guys get hit. Like, they, like, like hit by pitches are in a lot of, can be auto like il stints a lot jose altuve last year lost a decent portion of his season to a wild daniel bar yeah. it wasn't on purpose but it, it uh, obviously was 96 in but i'm saying it's like what if that was purposeful like is one homer worth three months of another guy's like career exactly like, and, are, we, are we serious and you know what i'm sure a lot of those guys so this is the only thing i find ironic about this a lot of those guys defenses is oh i don't have the best control it slipped out of my hand well if that is true right because that some part of them believes that i i know they're human right they're not stupid 
Yeah. If you don't have the best control, why would you be throwing at a guy intentionally? You could miss. You could be aiming for his middle of his back or his butt or whatever, but end up missing in a really horrible place up high or something like that and literally give a guy concussion issues for the rest of his life. Uh, another thing, no. it's like if, if someone cut you off on the road, <laughs> is, 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 a, is, a, is a proper response just throttling their backside of their car? Dude, dude, I just saw a circumstance. Funny enough, um, we were on the way to the uh, Angels uh, Yankees game. You remind me of this. Uh, somebody got out of their car, went up to someone else's car, was screaming at them, got back in their car, and then proceeded to, I don't know what they're mad over, try to cut them off in the middle of traffic just to spite them. And the other person, who is probably of a similar mindset as them, tried to refuse them the ability to do so, and they both almost ended up colliding with another car. Like... We'd consider those people stupid. We exactly in society we <laughs> yeah. consider those people to be unbalanced and stupid. We, we yeah. shouldn't be tolerating on the baseball field. And you know exactly. what? The yeah. old, old school mentality be damned. If your coach tells you to throw at somebody like that, he's not a good coach. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Hundred percent. All right, man. I'm, I'm excited. Now we're gonna move on to our AL Cy Young winner tier list. We've done, you know, three of the four of these big ones, right? So far, we might do Rookie of the Year, but you know, that's that's kind of a different award. But Actually, no, dude, I, I don't even think it's worth it. You know, t- today I was looking at Rookie of the Award award winners, and I saw an old one from 1985, Ozzie Guillen. You know, the famous yeah. manager. Oh yeah, he won the Rookie of the Year award in 1985 with a. 74 ops plus <laughs> he was a good fielder don't get me wrong yes. but like that's crazy <laughs> dude that that award has to be one of the most volatile and also it's like so narrative weird. based awards so weird 100%. like especially back then like where you know like this the like different statistical thinking and like what like was valuable like in retrospect those are crazy dude seriously <laughs> but yeah i'm excited man especially starting off with our first one right this one was like a transformative conversation it's an important in the baseball one. award scene yeah felix hernandez 13 and 12 right in olden days that's not impressive especially by the way coming off the year he'd had before uh seattle had not made the playoffs in 2009 but he had finished second in cy young voting with 19 wins along with a bunch of other great numbers yes but then the next season he proceeds to lose six wins off that total gain seven losses but has a 2.27 era faces the most batters in the league 174 era plus over 249 innings and thankfully, he ended up taking it. That was a yeah. huge deal because people were thinking that he probably didn't have much of a chance because he didn't have those wins. So it was very important for the baseball scene to understand that wins are a meaningless stat. <laughs> he really set the tone for a lot of the future races, right? Because, yes. like, you know, just, I mean, probably I think the Grom, pro- I think the Grom would have been the one later yes. to like set that tone, but. Like, Felix Hernandez was so obviously the best pitcher in baseball that year. And it really, like, wasn't that close. Because, like, from, like, an ERA standpoint, you know, he had the best raw ERA. You know, he had one of the best ERA pluses. But he also ate innings. 250 innings, 34 starts. Like, that's the thing. Like, prime... Prime Felix Fernandez, is, that's the thing the pitchers around this time, you know, like on the other side around that year, that's also like, you know, this is prime Lince to come era too, where there's just these guys that kind of were so dominant, but they kind of flamed out as they yes. didn't really age well. Like Felix pitched his last game in the big leagues at 33. Exactly. He, he had his last good season at like 29. Exactly. You know? So like, so like I'm, I'm happy we were able to get him a Cy Young. Yes, I've got an interesting take about him. So I thoroughly believe that if he had pitched in the 1970s, let's say, with the exact same numbers that he had, only he'd managed to average, let's say, you know, 15 wins a season. So he'd gotten to over 200 wins. I think right now he'd be in the Hall of Fame. There's so many guys with around a career 117 ERA plus from that era and like a little before that that had a few dominant seasons that ended up in the Hall of Fame. It's actually crazy. I'm not saying he deserved necessarily to be in the Hall of Fame, but his numbers read to me a lot like guys from that era who ended up there. Uh, But I mean, shout out to him for like some crazy seasons around that time, aside from this as well, where he maybe like deserved to win and got snubbed. I'm glad to see him ending up like getting immortalized for that uh, specifically. Yeah. So um, I'm thinking a tier for tearing this to me, to me, I'm 
kind of considering S tier just because of the volume of innings. We've talked about this That's on previous point. stuff. Um, it's hard point. to compare seasons, right? Because it's like, okay, we could compare a season from, you know, some sort of a Burt Barnstormer from the 1903 season had 500 innings. But I will <laughs> say Storm. that uh, 2010 was late enough that 249 innings was considered ridiculous at the time. So I'm going to say S tier just because a 174 ERA plus over that volume of innings it's almost like you get another third of a season out of a guy at an elite level in comparison to today's guys. I'm thinking, I'm uh, so I think, I think I, I, th- I agree to move him up to S tier. Cause now I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to what we have coming up. And I think, I think, yeah, no. Yeah. Cause again, but what's so funny about what's so funny about the comparison of AL and NL at this time is you'll notice that, the AL winner, a lot of these years, has like a drastically different like ERA. Yes, than the guys in like a bad way, but it's also good. Remember, they they're facing an extra hitter. Exactly, like that's one of these. <laughs> I mean, you consider contrasting stats from nineteen, you know, around nineteen seventy three, I believe, when the DH was yes around there. Uh, to like 2022, one, one, two, yeah, yeah. There is that factor in there where it's like it's so if funny. you look at the era pluses of those guys you'll see a lot of times the nl guys like have a lower era plus than you'd think right like pedro's a great example of that right an extra steroid hitter literally took like his you know era that was around what greg's maddox uh, greg maddox's was a few years before that and it literally was like 30 points better or more just because he had to face that extra roided out guy yeah well, and, and of and, course the roids is spread yeah i thought that was really funny so yeah Oh, we agree on S. And exactly. I mean, I mean, the thing is, like, this next one, there isn't really a conversation when it comes to the tier it is, because it's obviously where it's going to be. But 2011, Justin Verlander won the MVP award and the Cy Young. Dude, <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, rated this as an S tier in our MVP rankings. Yes. It might be, especially after looking at all the rest of these guys, that might have been a little much. But I will say, going back to defend myself, 251 innings and again 172 era plus led the league the one stat that really boggles my mind when looking at this is the fact that he had a, that season a 0.92 whip can you imagine over over that, that many innings yeah just That's ridiculous crazy. dude in, like in today's game it wasn't like he did this like you know like in the 50s you know exactly like, crazy. but i think another thing that's i mean you're the you're the michigan guy so i'm sure you have like <laughs> fun stories of like this era of Verlander. Oh yeah. Dude. Um, I mean, dude, I remember uh, one of the most like memorable points of this season was versus the Royals where he, in the ninth inning proceeded to mow down the heart of their order with 102 mile an hour fastballs, 100 to 102. And after he'd already thrown 120 plus pitches, like he, I don't think that we're going to see another guy like him partially because no one will be allowed to be like him. But I really do think he's the last of his era of guys who could throw that volume of pitches while also throwing that level of quality of pitches and that are allowed to have that kind of leash. Yeah. And like, I think that's, and this is not to be like old man yelling at Cloud. I feel like that's, <laughs> not, I feel like that's something like, I understand why it's not like that, you know, like letting pitchers go deeper into games, but something we lose is I feel like this guys eating innings is awesome. Like, I know Dude, it's like, yeah. Dude, a hundred percent. Like, dude, that mythical starting pitcher is starting to fade. And while yes, pragmatism works its way in there and it's kind of necessary, it is a little sad to see. Yeah. You know, especially when you compare to some of these these older uh records and even like some of these older seasons like he had, where it's like, you know, yeah, we're not gonna see it. Sandy Alcantara's at twenty twenty two season is pretty much the closest we're gonna get. And I don't even know the next time we're gonna see one of those. Yeah, and one more thing I will throw out there because I, I was I was curious is that um against against teams over five hundred this season, he had an ERA of two, so he was worse against worse teams than he was against good teams. He was like Spencer Strider, but just like better. Yeah, but versus but like yeah, oh my god, that's that's funny. 
Dude, so S tier, S tier, obviously. Hey, Will Smooth is not the last time we're going to talk about Justin Verlander. Don't get me wrong, but let me just oh, yeah. say, shout out to the guy who's 41 years old, coming off of major surgery, who right now is a 118 ERA plus and almost nine Ks per nine as a literally like a guy who started pitching before the Obama administration, bro. Dude, that's true. Yeah, like no, but like a few years before. Oh, 2005 was his yeah, first dude. season. Dude, he was there when like Bush just got reelected. He was he was eating innings. You, you know what's me? actually nuts? Okay, one last <laughs> one last little fact about well, not fact, but kind of just statement about Verlander. He went to college. Most guys who have had that level that of longevity, true. they right, they're like Felix Hernandez, right? They started pitching when they were 19, 20, maybe twenty one at the earliest. His first major league season was not until he was twenty two, and he only pitched in two games. So his first full season was when he was twenty three, and he still managed to do everything that he's done. And I will That's say this, crazy. and I will say this, like Ver, Ver, Verlander is pitching far better than his ERA may oh, impose yeah. right now because he had like a really rough start against the Yankees of all teams. <laughs> of <course. laughs> Dude, I, don't even get me started. Out of all the times he's just destroyed us <laughs> now we're getting him when he's like four, this is like bullying. He's like exactly, 41 dude. and now we can hit him. But oh, no, God. I mean, well, he, was, he just... was awesome last night. Let's just hope the uh, Astros stay out of the playoffs so they don't end up matching up against the Yankees and he can throw, uh, you know, 15 oh, scoreless innings and yeah. one yeah, ALDS. Like, yeah, he'll start throwing like 101 again. And then it's going to be, <laughs> Dude, yeah, yeah. Kate Upton's going to be che- like, going to get like the Taylor Swift treatment. And oh, over. yeah, dude. All right. <laughs> we both agree. Agree. S tier. Easy. Yeah. 2012, mm. David Price. <laughs> it's arguable here that JV should have won back to back. I almost feel like there's a little bit of like voter burnout. Fatigue? Voter I think fatigue. so. He had been top five uh, at this point, like, like I think three out of the last five years. So like, I, I get it. I get that he had been like so consistently good, which is kind of a dumb reason, honestly, not but to go for somebody. Price but... had 20 wins. Exactly. 20 whole wins. And, you know, Verlander, <laughs> just the peasant that he was, had only 17. Yeah. Even you though know. he had. 20 more innings. Is it 20 or is it 30? I believe 27, 20. 27 more innings, dude. So basically 30. The basically same 30. year, right? With the same year, right? Oh, dude. That's crazy. Yeah. And the Rays, you know, it's so crazy to me, too, because the Rays didn't end up like having any kind of substantial playoff run. And the Tigers went to the World Series. It shows how much voters kind of like got in their own way back at that time period when things weren't as numerically based because it was yes. a bit nonsensical. Like if you look at this and kind of like observed throughout the annals of baseball history, who should have gotten this award? The only thing that would point you towards him getting it, Price, would have been the wins, even though everything else would have pointed towards Verlander. So worst ERA plus, like you said, worst lower innings. Actually had, like you said, a slightly better ERA. But, I mean, dude, 27 less innings. That's how many starts. Like, that's five mediocre starts nowadays, four good starts back then. Ridiculous. Yeah. I Honestly, I still would probably consider it i would consider it a b tier i i want to say a tier just because he still had a 150 era plus but that kind of like you know snubbing verlander along with the fact that it was a good season but offense wasn't crazy up that year or anything like that so it wasn't an insane season i'm gonna say b tier i'm gonna say b tier too because i think like i said i probably would have voted for verlander if i had had a vote so i think that kind of spoiler alert here on this list, I think we have our first C tier. And I will get to it. I am going to argue oh. it's a C tier. <laughs> oh, okay. I, mean, yeah, I mean, I know what you're talking about. But... So if that C tier is the B tier, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm a, I want to shout out a player who finished in Cy Young voting this year. Number five uh, is Fernando Rodney. Um, <laughs> so, this, so, so this is 2012 Fernando Rodney, at, which is like peak Fernando Rodney. Okay. How many runs? This, so this, this is the question. How many runs did Fernando Rodney allow in his last 45 games? Zero. One. Earned Dude. run. He allowed, he allowed one earned run in his final 45 games. And in his final 52 games, he allowed two earned runs. Dude, th- that was one of those years that I-, I remember when he was doing it. Everybody was kind of waiting for a blow up. Like just, you know, one, just one outing where he gives up three nope. earned runs or something like that. And it literally never came. I will say another thing that's funny is I'm a big Fernando Rodney fan, right? Like I, I- he was at every pitch team. Forever. He pitched forever. He had some good seasons to the Tigers. Do you know what his next best career ERA was? 
So this year is 0. 0.60. So yeah. I'm a, was it like in the low twos? 2.85. And he, that was the only other season in his whole career. He was under <laughs> three. So funny. Wait, what was his ERA plus? That uh, in 2005, he did. Okay, shout out to oh him. Oh my God. Yeah, it, literally like one of the it, like <laughs> Zach Britton levels of good. Wait, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah dude shout out to him in 2005 he also had a, a 2.86 era but only in 44 innings so not even not a, necessarily a full season for a reliever but that's crazy a also zero i also want to shout out a 39 year old fernando rodney for giving up when he joined the marlins one earned run in 28 and two-thirds innings that's go dude dude Come seriously on, he was it, oh, turn me up if you want to have a cheat code on uh, immaculate grid Fernando Rodney All Star for the San Diego Padres in 2016. I've gotten so many points on that, dude. And that that no one no one picks that. Okay, so I think like we said, this one definitely is a B tier. So yeah. we're moving on now to 2013, and in my opinion, like another unequivocal B tier. Like I yeah, love Mad Max. He had a good year. This is such a weird one. Like, like he was like so. Like this is one of the seasons. So I remember when this was happening. And I'm, I mean, I know you do too, because you mm-hmm. you grew up like, you know, with, with the Tigers. And I remember that in the first half of this season, he was, wait, not, was it the first half? It was. He was started off the season like, like wasn't it like 17 and 0? Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't like it like that. something crazy? Like he was like, he was like seven. And he, wait, he was having, I'm, 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 I'm get the exact number. Yeah, he was having a good season. I remember uh, being a Tigers fan that, like, it was amazing to see essentially, like, JV, who at the time people were like, oh, he's kind of passing on the baton. Like, he's not going to be the ace anymore. Mm-hmm. Little did they know what would end up happening in the career of Justin Verlander. But uh, it was nice to see him kind of take a step forward because he had always been a guy who had really good stuff but hadn't had really good results. So, but I do think that the wins specifically, because that was the whole narrative. Oh, my that, God, he's, that he's 15 0, 16 0. That's why I think he ended up winning because his 144 ERA plus was like, I mean, again, people weren't looking at that near as much back then, but even as more peripheral numbers, like a 2.90 ERA, pretty good. I mean, it's not not bad, that's for sure. Below three, but it was nothing crazy. The only thing he led the league in, aside from the absolutely crazy, stupid stat of wins was, and winning percentage, was whip, which is good. Again, like, you know, better whips equal better performances. Mm-hmm. It's like it's the way that it is. But it was not an unequivocal season. And on top of that, you know, a little bit still of one of those ones that has a, a, the stink of the old way of thinking on, especially with the seasons he ended up having that ended up being Cy Young years. I, because here's the thing. So I, okay. So I was right. So he did not have a single losing decision in the first half of the season, or I think he may have had one or whatever. So he had, no, he had no losing decisions in like the first half, right? That it, but, and I remember at the time, like, dude, this guy's like insane because I didn't really know better, but he had it. He had an ERA of three there, and the second half, he had, he had like a way better ERA, but he had like two losing decisions. So like it was it kind of I think it was kind of like a, one of those people looked at it as like a, kind of like a fall off, but like he was actually better. But something that I think is really interesting about this Cy Young slate is the Japanese presence. So like it's you it's you Darvish's first like real like breakout season. Yes, uh, underrated, underrated. Kashi Iwakuma, Iwakuma, <laughs> Hasashi Iwakuma, Hasashi Iwakuma, <laughs> Hasashi Iwakuma. Oh my! No, you you got the point. And Koji Uehara, yes. all were dominant. Koji was insane out of the pen. Yes, and you know those two were just and Darvish and Iwakuma were innings eaters, and they're amazing. And by the way, Matt Max's teammate Anibal Sanchez led the league in ERA. He literally had an extremely underrated season. He, always, though. He was so always. underrated, always, because he he was just so overshadowed. Dude, yes. Everything he was a part of, he ended up being a little overshadowed. But he was always pretty consistently good, especially towards the latter half of his career. Funny enough, from like ages like 35 to 39, he had like kind of weirdly like the best consistent stretch of his career. But yeah, I yeah. think we both agree. Like, you know, Mad Max B tier for 2013. Yes. 100%. Moving on to 2014. I think this is probably the first instance we're going to look at of like a solid, completely like sold A tier season. 
Uh, Kluber was amazing this season. Corey Kluber yes. was amazing this season, but he was not up to the levels that Justin Verlander was, Felix Hernandez was in terms of volume and some of the quality of the later guys to come. It was a really good season, but it wasn't, you know, the most earth shattering season. It was a lot better than the year Mad Max has had, had had before. 2.44 ERA, 269 strikeouts. That's a nice number. Uh, 235 innings. Again, extremely impressive, especially relative to where guys are now. Uh, maybe the most impressive stat of all of it to me would be his FIP, which was actually 2.35. You don't see a lot of guys who are ground ball pitchers outperforming their FIP, but that goes to yeah. show his strikeout abilities at the time. Finished 11th in MVP voting. You know, I think a solid A tier. I think a solid A tier too, even though um, I feel like Felix Hernandez was tit for tat with him in basically every category. Mm -hmm. But I mean, performance wise, you would kind of, I'd want to give it to. Quay Kluber, is this the season where, is this it? Yeah, this is the, shout out my boy Phil Hughes. Yeah, seriously. The, uh, this is the year where he had um, a record setting 11.63 strikeout to walk ratio. Um, that's going to last until George Kirby has his career best season. Exactly. Because um, he's been flirting with a crazy number. But like once George Kirby has like that, like his best season, he's going to break that. But shout out Phil Hughes for holding a weird MLB Oh, record. yes, yeah, giving up the same number of home runs as he did walks at 16 each, which, by the way, that wa that home run rate was one of the best in the league, too. So 16 it was walks. 16 walks, 16 home runs, 209 innings. What's funny is he wasn't that good overall. Like a 111 ERA plus, his three was pretty good, but he wasn't, like, crazy good or anything. But literally, I think that stat propelled him to being top 10 in MB or Cy Young voting. That's the only season in his career where he was above six and strike out to walk ratio, which again, six would be really good, but like, and he was at 11.63. Because as I'm saying, like, it, it it really is a weird outlier because like while he did throw strikes, like he didn't have, like he had good walk numbers, but like a lot, it was usually over two, mid two, yeah. slow two, like exactly. 0.7 with an 8K. Like it, it was like a really like weird outlier season. Seriously. Okay, so shut we up, agree up. A tier, right? Yes. Okay, moving on to Keiko. Uh, another in 2015, I think another B tier. Like, it's kind of on the edge of A tier. It's definitely a lot less decidedly B tier, in my opinion, than like, you know, Mad Max in 2013. But I think it doesn't quite get to that level. You know, we can argue about the dominance matrix, which I think, you know, they are important. Uh, he didn't have anywhere near the K per nines or, you know, the whips of some of these guys. Or eight innings. Give him credit for, I'll give him credit for eating innings. He ate a lot of innings. And on, on top of that, you know, he's the best fielding pitcher in baseball at that time, which obviously, you know, gold gloves, right? He got a gold glove. That's huge. Yeah, but yeah, he was a dog when it came to field. He actually know. was. Like, I, I'm yeah, joking. He really now, was. But yeah, he, he really was. was. <laughs> he, had, he had a whip and he had a good whip too. Don't get me wrong. Just not quite up the level of some of these other guys, especially later. Mm -hmm. uh, 120 games. So obviously he deserved the Cy Young. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Led the league in shutouts, that too. Uh, top five in MVP voting to me is fascinating because while this season was, like I said, I mean, it was good. I'm not going to crap on it. I, I would say it's probably B tier. Top five in MVP voting makes no sense at all. But, you know, uh, so yeah, I think he, B tier. I think that's fair. Um, I mean, I, I remember he kind of, for me, I remember at the time I was watching, it felt like he came out of nowhere. All I do remember is him um torching my yankees in the wild card game oh uh, my god Dude, and, and a different start and sparking, versus the yankees and spark and sp just sparking um you know the the astros just destroying us every october dude dude uh, i also shout out to dallas keichel for his 2020 mickey mouse performance where he had a 224 era plus and a 1.99 era in 63 innings. oh yeah and like was top five in Cy young voting yeah. exactly just top five though imagine if you had a 1.99 era in the al over a full season and you were like fifth in Cy young voting it shows how yeah. weird that season was but all right so we agree b tier now we come to you know Obviously, my personal favorite decision uh, in Cy Young voting history, when Mr. Rick Porcello of Beat the Boston out. Red Sox <laughs> dominated his way through the 2016 season, striking out an incredible seven point something batters per nine innings, 
winning every game he had a chance to pitch in route to barely edging out in one of the closest Cy Young decisions ever, Justin Verlander. But like, but think about that. That that year, Rick Porcello won the Cy Young Award, but had less first place votes than the runner up. That is, uh, he, he he electoral colleged his way to a Cy Young. Dude. I've uh, never okay. seen anything like it. <laughs> dude, nobody had. And I remember Kate Upton just going absolutely ballistic on the voters after that. Because the truth is, he should not have gotten the second place votes that he got. Like, that, that is dude. one of the most bizarre decisions I've ever seen in awards voting. Because there's really nothing about him that showed he deserved this season aside from purely wins. 315 ERA. Pretty good. Not bad. Yeah. Again, well, pretty it, good. It, it was a down year for pitchers, but still. Like, yes. A lot of guys were competing with him. He had a 142 ERA plus. That's good. Strikeout to yeah. walk ratio, 5.91. Led the league. That's good. 7.6 uh, strikeouts per nine. That's the, what I said. He had a seven something strikeouts per nine. But let me just – okay, so if you're hearing all that and you're like, oh, well, I mean, that's pretty good, right? So and obviously it makes kind of sense why you get 254 strikeouts in 227 innings is what there Justin Verlander did. Here we go. Here we go. With here a better go. ERA at 3.04. Yeah. Still won 16 games for all the morons out there who thinks that matters. And on top of all of that, league leading 1.001 whip in a year that, like you said, was a down year for pitchers and – 10 strikeouts per nine over 227 innings, like I said before. Like, are you actually kidding me? I then think there's for, no comparison. For me, I feel like, for me, if this is also a year where I think you can justify giving it to a reliever, which I'm not, I'm not Mr. The Zach big, Britton, biggest fan of, but when you do what Zach Britton did in this season, where he allowed four runs over 67 innings and had a 803 ERA plus. It might be the best season from a reliever we've ever seen, or at least the best season we've seen since 2000, which by the way, Mariano Rivera played from 2000 to like 2013. Yeah. Like that's yeah, how like good peak that year wise, was. This is one of the greatest peaks for a relief pitcher ever. And like, I, I understand the whole argument of not wanting to give it to a relief pitcher. Like that's, that's fine. Yeah. But like when you have a year, this weird, like where it's, like you, you, it's just a lot of guys did the same thing. Like obviously, like Berlander, I think should have won the award. Strikeout difference, he had a better ERA. Like definitely, like you know, like I think that. But there really wasn't like a standout pitcher. Like for example, even if Verlander won the award this year, we'd still put him in. We'd put him in B tier. I, I, yes, I would yes. think I would hit a one forty so, ERA plus. Like no, like it wasn't. It wasn't like a. It was a, an amazing year, especially the context of what other people did. But it wasn't compared to these other guys in the list. So, yeah, this is just this, this is, is the famous cooked. And this award. is a C tier for me because like you said, it's doing it. Verlander. I, 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 yeah. Verlander would be a B tier. So this and is a C tier. Okay, yeah, and I also so want to I, I let me I'm the biggest hater of this season, right? Because obviously I've had, at that point I was a Tigers fan and he was a former yeah, was, Tiger. So, yeah. let me let me just I want to share one little fact for you. So, okay, so war is a terrible stat for pitchers. All right, let me just get that out of the way. Terrible stat it for is pitchers. Bad. But Rick Porcello in 223 innings that season had a 4.7 war. Do you know what Zach Britton had in 67 innings? It was a four. Yeah, he had 4.1. He almost had the same war in literally less than a third of the innings. Ridiculous. Yeah, that's, that's that's terrible. And and you want to hear something else that's terrible? This is even worse, actually. Zach Britton finished 11th in Cy Young voting. Verlander finished seventeenth. Porcello wasn't in the top twenty. So for MVP voting for MVP voting. So, so that makes no that sense make at all. Sense? I think that you, what you said about the electoral college, like him electoral it's college, true. it's exactly what it like was. Like he just like he was in every top three or top two, and he just like st- like as I'm saying, like how like the, I'm just so confused how people how it was so weird that. He won the Cy Young voting, but two of the guys behind three actually, because Corey Kluber finished 19th. Three of the guys behind him finished top 20 in MVP voting, but he didn't. <laughs> Dude. How li- is that even possible? One of what the most did- bizarre voting decisions ever. 
I think if he gave a lot of those guys a chance to recast their vote, they wouldn't have voted for him just because they knew it would happen. Like they didn't want that outcome. Nobody was voting for him first place, or very few people were. Was it? I think was it like everyone was just like, "I'll vote for Rick." Exactly. Like like, everyone did it, and they're like, "Oh no!" (laughs) (laughs) It's like the guy that accidentally pressed the wrong button and voted for what's his name, the 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 reliever from 2021 that got like one MVP. Oh yes, yes, yes. I think you're talking about. That's yeah, dude. Well, okay, so but you know what? Let's wash the taste of that season out of our mouth with 2017 Corey Kluber. Just the prime Corey Kluber season, in my opinion, an unequivocal S tier. This season, honestly, we don't talk enough about 2017 Corey Kluber. So first of yeah. all, that offense that season was crazy, right? So what he was able to do in in direct opposition to one of the best offensive eras in baseball history was crazy and you can tell because his era of 2.25 which again very good but not you know it's not a it's not even felix hernandez from 2014 that came out to an era plus of 202 he had he was doubly as good as the average pitcher that time 0.87 whip 215 or 203 innings struck out 265 batters yeah like literally his best season ever and like kind of the end of that era the next season he was really good but he wasn't anywhere near that good and he never ended up getting back there after that one of my favorite seasons of that time period also because i was seeing him i was still into the tigers that time so he had a number of starts against the tigers that season and it felt like every time he go out there he'd strike out like 13 batters in seven innings give up like one hit it was a sight to behold how many times did so in his in his 29 starts how many times did Coy Kluber strike out double digit hitters? 16 times. 15. 15 Over times. Half the time. Over 15 half the time. times. That's crazy. Okay, okay. And, and 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 if you bring it down, he struck out at least eight batters 22 times out of 29. That's ridiculous consistency. And I also do want to shout out 29 starts, 203 innings the year before he had, had 32 so three more starts and he threw 215 innings so that means that on a per rate basis he was getting the most out of his starts volume wise he could he had five complete games that season the most of his career in only 29 starts one, and one more one more for you with the with the whole um how many i would say like would you agree like the benchmark for like a good start is probably like three or less runs allowed yes 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 and like he 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 ate innings, but yeah. How many out of his out of his twenty nine starts? How many times did Kluber allow three or less runs? Uh, uh twenty six. That is actually almost spot on. It was twenty five. Twenty five out of twenty. Well, that also shows, by the way, that he had a, a couple a couple seasons that brought that or a couple um starts that brought that ERA up. Because damn. That level of run prevention yeah. is crazy. Because because think about this. Like he he only out of his 20, this is actually crazy in retrospect. Out of his 29 starts, he only went less than five innings once, which is against Detroit. And um, I but like aren't you think about that? So basically, considering that his one the one to me he didn't do that was a blow-up start. In 28 starts, he went five innings and allowed three or less runs and basically all of them. Like he gave the guardians at the time, Indians a chance to win every time he was on the mat. Just ridiculous. One of the best peaks yeah. of all time. If you haven't seen the Jolly Olive video on his peak, you should go look that up. That it's is really funny too. One more, one more thing on Kluber. Cause I thought it was really funny is that. So like in, I was in a group chat and people were talking about like you Darvish and like a potential you Darvish, like hall of fame case. Mm. And it's so funny, which is like, cause like, okay, like he's an accumulator. Like he's been there. Like he's a decent war. Like he's, he's short. Like he's definitely short, but yeah. like, I feel like it's one of those cases where it's, if you think Darvish is a hall of fame case, like Kluber has to have a hall of fame. Case. Oh dude. I, 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 a... I don't, I don't think he's going to be able to, but still like what he did in, over the course of five, six years was like lints to come level, but a bit longer. Right? Dude, yes. I, I would say that the only, and this is kind of going to a morphing uh, view of how we look at Hall of Fame pitchers, which I was thinking about making a video on this at some point, which is that we have to redefine the benchmarks for who a Hall of Fame pitcher is because 3,000 innings doesn't make any sense anymore. 3,000 strikeouts doesn't even necessarily make sense. Guys are getting strikeouts more now, but sustaining that over a long, long period of time is really hard considering the injuries that go on in today's modern game. 
Mm -hmm. So I think that somebody like Jacob deGrom, right? I think that he has a good solid hall of fame case. If you kind of re just kind of reevaluate how you look at that, somebody like Darvish and Kluber, I think kind of fall outside of that realm still for me, because it's like, imagine having that level of a prime, but then only maintaining it for like five, six years. Yes. Uh, same thing for Lincecum too. It's like, in my opinion, for two years. Yeah. He was Quint only good for great for two years. Quintessential hall of very good. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I love Darvish too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I remember when Darvish first came over in 2012, I was like, cause he faced the Tigers one point and he threw like a, a 68 mile an hour curveball to me. El Cabrera made him spin around in his shoes. And I was just like, damn, who the hell is this guy? But it's awesome. Yeah. It, he had almost that perfect game the next year, but what funny thing about Darvish, just like one little aside on him, he's only had like really two or three seasons where he's been really good aside from, yeah. you know, the, the, um, a bridge season. So only really two or three seasons where he's been really good. Aside from that, he's been like quintessentially solid. A 117 ERA plus five points worse than Kluber. Yeah. Over like he's, his career. yeah, he's just a, an amazingly solid pitcher. Exactly. So unless, unless, unless he has some crazy back stretch, like he's, probably he's, not. he's hollow. Very good. Exactly. Okay. So the next season, I think we have back-to-back -back S tiers here. Okay, so hear me out. Ooh, okay. Blake Snell, 2018, not the most volume, right? That's a, that's going to be the argument here when we have a guy like this uh, coming out uh, for a season where you have a 1.89 ERA, but you only have 180 innings pitched. The one of the lowest totals, maybe the lowest total in a full season that we'll see on this list. But for me, I had to look yeah, at one so. number. I had to look at one number. 217 ERA plus relative to the rest of the one, league. Yeah. And 118, 189 ERA, yeah. This is the crazy part to me. This season, long balls are flying like nothing else until 2019. But he gave up 16 home mm. runs in 180 innings as a power pitcher. At the trop, too. And the at trop the trop. is like if you pull, if a righty pulls a fly ball at the trop, it's like Yankee Stadium. He had a five you, point you, you see, five point uh, six hits allowed per nine innings. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's reliever no. levels are ridiculous. Yeah, you see, yeah. this is an interesting one for me because, like, I totally agree it with the with what you're saying. I think it's also interesting um, the Verlander argument in here, where you have a guy who pitched so many more innings, and like I like I think like you said, I think just the the run prevention of Snell, like you you give it to him, but. I, th I I do think it's interesting just like how a guy like how 180 innings was was able to get him the Cy Young. And we've seen stuff like that in the past. Like guys have won even even back in the day, like you'd be surprised. Like guys have won Cy Youngs with 180, 190 innings. Um, but I th I, I do think it's interesting that Verlander almost stole it from him with <laughs> an ERA that much higher. Dude, yeah. I mean, I, volume matters. We've talked about this before. I mean, would you rather have a guy with a war of nine over 162 games or a guy with a war of seven over 110? Yeah, the guy with a war of seven over 110 was a better baseball player. Like, again, using war here as kind of a simple stat yes. uh, to approximate this, he's a better baseball player. Like, if you over a full season, that'd have been a lot higher than nine. However, at the end of the day, you still would rather the guy who's been on the field more and able to contribute more. But in this case, for me, the quality difference was just too drastic. I think it's a S tier. Yeah. And I, I want, I want to do a quick shout out of a, a, of another guy because, you know, I like doing that. So 2018, 2018, Chris sale. Um, he, he, he finished top five in this Cy Young award voting with only 158 innings. And a big part of that was that he had a 10 start stretch in the summer that he pitched 65 innings and struck out 109 batters. <laughs> oh, my. That's... For a little context, by the way, this season he has a 212 ERA, 192 ERA plus. Amazing. Insane, right? He's had 10 starts. Good uh, means of comparison. He's, He's pitched awesome. 63 innings, right? Yeah. 78 Ks again, insane. 11 that's 11 Ks per nine. That's right in line with his career numbers, dude. He had a hundred dude. over a hundred in 600, 109 Ks. In that's 60, reliever level, like dominant reliever 65 level numbers. Five innings that is so stupid. And like some of these starts, like just looking at them, like their game logs, it's just like. Like he struck out twelve batters over five innings and one hit allowed against um the Orioles. I think he left that game with an injury. Dude. But then like there's like he had from from 
the 19th of June to the 11th of July, he struck out 11 batters each start. Dude. <laughs> At least 11. Like, dude, like, that is so crazy. Like, he never won a Cy Young because more because of circumstances yes. where he wasn't able to, you know, put it all together over a full year or someone just had a better year. But, like, maybe this season, a dude. A lot of, <laughs> dude, a lot of his dominance gets kind of overshadowed. Dude, seriously, yeah. He's having the best, by the way, best strikeout to walk ratio of his career right now. I do want to shout that out because awesome. he wasn't I've always watched him a looked bunch. at. Yeah, he wasn't always looked at as a guy with the best control. He's evolved into a pitcher with really good control for a long period, but crazy to see him if you had looked at him back when he was drafted as a reliever who had control issues to the pitcher he's evolved to now. Uh, okay, so back to, in my opinion, we have back-to-back -back seasons here of S tier. And another guy who didn't have the most innings ever. Oh, wait, no, this isn't Justin Verlander's low inning season, but the, the still, uh, this is a season oh, where yeah, yeah. Verlander threw up what, in my opinion, one of the best seasons of all time uh, in this one specific respect. Do you understand how low his whip was this year? Can you give me an approximate guess as to how, what his whip was? It was around 0. 0.8. 0. 0.803. Yeah. But this is the bizarre part of the season. He had a 2.58 ERA, right? Again, good, but not what you'd expect with that level of, of uh, base runner prevention. 5.5 hits per nine. You know how many home runs he gave up this season? A lot of home runs. It was more than no starts. He had. Six. Yeah. Yes. 36 but, home so runs. So the fascinating thing about this season is the, the, the race. <laughs> because it was him versus his teammate. Garrett who Cole, both who, had over 300 strikeouts by the way yeah yeah which is so funny because like i always like for me like as a yankees fan like sometimes i forget that cole was an astro just because he's just been so awesome for us yeah like, but like he had Garrett Cole had the famous uh, people post this way too much like like no like no like like we're in the baseball space but i guarantee some people like listening like no mm -hmm. like there's just certain things get like recycled so much and like that that one graphic it's like yes 20, They've won his last 25 starts and he has like a 0 0.0 ERA. Like, obviously insane, but like it kind of gets overshared. But still, Garrett Cole like, had, had a pretty rough start to his season. Like, at the end of May, he had a 4 ERA. So, like, it was like it was pretty disappointing. But in his last, you know, 21 starts, he was he was God. Dude, but still, seriously. Like, I, and I think I think that's what kind of screwed him the end which is verlander was so consistent and he threw more innings he started more games and they basically have the same era Dude, so that's why i think he edged him out but shout out to the uh, uh juiced ball era as well for 29 home runs allowed by garrett cole in this season as well but he had a league leading era of 2.50 it is by though because cole like cole is pr prone to the long ball that's, that's anyone who works up in the zone or like you know like Try to try to blow past you with like a heater, right? It but is like, crazy to think he allowed crazy, more dude. home runs in 2022 than he did that season, which was the year yeah, of the dude, long no, that ball. Was, that was brutal. That like because that, that's how those guys get beat. But for example, like for a comparison, so one, two, three, four, five. Six, I can't count. So there's six months in in MLB season if you combine April, March, and September, October. You know, because it's bleeding. Yeah. Over. Justin Verlander in five of those six months had an era of two five or lower right and um garrett cole started the season with a 395 in april and then a 413 in may and then he was god for the rest of the year right so it, i think it's what i think that's what it was verlander pitched 11 more innings and he was just good the entire year and that, yeah that's what just the i was saying like i don't think this is a robbery at all I no just, no not at like, all that's just it was kind of your there wasn't a wrong choice but this is also a really funny circumstance where cole finished higher in mvp voting dude yeah that is crazy it shows how much mvp voting is almost like based on recency bias in comparison to something like cy young voting mm -hmm. i would have this season probably an a tier a 179 era plus is amazing don't get me mm -hmm. wrong um but this doesn't have the additional 30 plus innings that Brandon Leonard had in his last Cy Young season or that um, even Felix Hernandez had, uh, but it is a similar like around there ERA. Um, he also he had 300 strikeouts. That's insane. Don't get me wrong again. The K rates were up as well. I felt like everybody was going boom or blast this season. Like, if, I mean, yeah, Cole had 326 Ks. I almost come close to that since. So yeah, I think I have this in A tier. 
Maybe the yeah. edge of S tier, but I'd, I'd keep it at A tier. Personally. I think we should throw it in for A for now and then yeah. maybe flip it forward because of the historical competition he had with his team. That's fair. That's fair. But like he beat out another in the same season. Let's do what we did for every one of these. Let's dedicate a solid 30 seconds to the Mickey Mouse champion <laughs> of the AL Cy Young race. The Shane Central, Bieber. Both in the Central that year because those, both office, this, the those teams weren't great. So <laughs> they're able to steamroll their way to mid one ERA against we, like we were talking We were talking about offenses. strikeout rates, you know, uh, solid 14.2 strikeout rate for Shane Bieber this season with a Chris Saley in 77 innings pitched and 122 strikeouts. Yeah, he was awesome. It's just like we can't I, – I can't do it. You know, nope. 12, 12 games pitched. A lot – I think – Pitchers right now are at 12 games pitched. Exactly. No? Dude, I still would take it over the uh over the Rick the Porcello, Porcello season. So I, yes, I'm giving it. it yes, I'm <laughs> Let's do it. I'm, so uh, I'm cool with the hating. But yeah, dude, pitchers right now with like 10 games pitched. Dude, so I seriously. feel like that's what we're talking about. Like, right. That so level I, of season yeah. so far. All right, dude, moving on. Robbie Ray, one of the more bizarre stories of this entire list coming out of completely left field. I mean, he'd always had like stretches of dominance. I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong. He actually has one of the highest, I think second highest K per nine ever for a starting pitcher. Yes. Um, so the, he has good stuff. Always has had good stuff. However, to expect him to win the Cy Young voting this season and lead with the 157 ERA plus. I'm not saying like he didn't deserve it either. 193 innings actually led the league. Is that correct? He led the league with 193 innings pitch. That's that's bizarre. 248 strikeouts. Again, very good. Leading any whip. Uh, top 15 in MVP voting. In my opinion, just because of like some of these comparatively lower numbers, must have been a terrible year for pitching. Honestly, worse than I remember. So uh, this was so B2. sorry. Uh, this was the sticky substance here yeah and okay. because and because of that um garrett cole was under a lot of uh, was under a huge microscope yeah and he was running away with the cy young and then he had, like, he had like a weird summer stretch which i don't necessarily think was that related to sticky substances i think it was more of like a coincidence where like he had like a hard strike tried and like a lot know. of balls started flying out that weren't yeah. flying out earlier exactly like short could have been influenced short but i think it was more of like what i'm saying like it was more like yeah. a factor but robbie ray has always kind of been an underrated pick you know it's funny like i feel like i feel like there's a chance that spencer strider may have a robbie ray like career like yes. if he doesn't I, th I think robbie ray's a reasonable not floor because like oh my god like he's robbie ray's an awesome pitcher but like kind of like a mid like a like, like a 80th percentile outcome let's say yes where it's like he strikes out the world but doesn't have the lowest era like i mean he has a 109 of... era plus for his career i'd say that a floor of that is probably realistic for strider just because yeah, strider... Yeah, like, like, like a 70th percentile outcome where it's yeah. like like he can he can like it, it, if he's disappointing like i think he could be robbie Wright. Right. And that's and that's that's, that's and, great and, news for Spencer Strider. Yeah. And also telling for how good Robbie yeah. Ray has been throughout his career. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but, but like, we tier. Yes, I think yeah. We move on to who's this? Who's the just Justin Verlander? Eleven that's years girl. after that's her his guy. first Cy Young? Guy. Are you kidding me? That's her that's her guy. Dude, <laughs> S tier, in my opinion, this season. Now he didn't throw that many innings. That's the thing. This is a weird Verlander Cy Young season because Verlander's always been that guy who accumulates a ton of innings, and that's like part of what the um the uh, conversation is, right? Is the quality of his pitching over the course of that amount of innings. This season, he only had 28 starts, 175 innings pitched, less than Snell, actually the least on the list aside from Mickey Mouse uh, competitors. Six, uh, a, a nice 666 batters faced, but in all that time, he had a two- 18 era plus somehow the best mark of the entire video at 39 years old just that was, quality of pitching to me it means he has to get an s tier yeah like he was kind of he was just kind of like unreal that entire season i, I remember was it against the twins at minute made park where he kind of had where he like threw like six perfect innings and then called it a day or something no he threw six no hit innings, and the only base runner was a drop third stripe. I think <laughs> that's what it was. And then he just called it a day. I was like, oh, dude, yeah, this is sick. And 
a lot of people don't talk about this, right? We we love playing narrative ball here uh, at the Make, Making the Cut podcast. Yes. He was coming off of a literal Tommy John surgery. Two he years had always off. been two years off. He had always been extremely, extremely consistent and had never had a lot of injury issues around the mid uh, 2010s. He dealt with some core issues that really sapped his performance, but he had still managed to throw, you know, at least 130 innings every one of those seasons and over 200, the vast majority of them. Yes. So this was like a big thing for him having a big surgery like that. And for him to come back and post by far the best ERA of his career, by far the best ERA plus of his career. Absolutely insane. Again, shout out to him for having a pretty good start and, to his season this season as well. And they um they they won the World Series. I know this doesn't matter, but they won they won the World Series that year. But we play another narrative. Thing, another thing I want to throw out there because you know I I like I think my, my I like throwing talking about the other guys finish behind them. One hundred percent. Teammate teammate Framber Valdez had a twenty five star twenty five quality start streak. That's season. crazy. 25 consecutive quality starts. That is nuts. Um, which is so, so crazy because I feel like so this was Ot- Otani was insane on the mound this year. So was Alec Alec Manoa was insane on the mound this year. That's funny. And like and Dylan Cease was unreal too, but like no one was really close to Verlander. Dude, dude, I have to shout the stat out because I always have to, because it's actually obscene. So when we think of Shohei, right? You mentioned Shohei. When we think of Shohei, we, I think a lot of people at this point in his career think of him as like one of the best hitters in baseball. He's still, this season, is one of the best hitters in baseball. Crazy, crazy good. And then pitching, he's like really good, right? But he's not nearly as good of a pitcher as he is a hitter, right? Well, mm. let me just, uh, if anyone who says that, let me tell you this. He's, he's Justin Verlander <laughs> has three career Cy Youngs. Justin Verlander, has an ERA plus in his career, for all that matters to anybody who's listening, 11 points worse than Shohei Otani. A lot of innings. Don't get me wrong. It's a lot of yeah, innings. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not making the comparison he's a better pitcher here. But I'm just saying, that should give you a bit of an idea as to how good Shohei Otani has been over the course of his career on the mound. And if we're going to compare a stat like OPS plus and ERA plus, which they're basically meant to do the same thing, he, his yeah. OPS plus is only eight points better than his ERA plus. Yeah, and I, I just want to I want to throw this out there. If if there was a world, which I don't think this will happen, just because, um, I don't know if you'll ever necessarily get the volume to do so. But if Otani ever won a Cy Young award, I feel like to play narrative ball. I feel like at that point it's like wow, like yeah, this really is the greatest player ever. Because like, like for example, like last year, like just going on a tangent, when when he went down with the elbow injury, he was leading the AL and OPS and ERA plus at the same time. Like, like that's like because like we're talking like he was the bet technically when it comes to runs, like preventing and generating, he was, was the best. best at both at the same time. He has like, a top four Cy Young finish in his career with only 100 innings pitched that season. Yeah, which is fascinating. I'm saying I don't know if he'll ever pitch like I don't know if he'll ever have the workload to really yes. compete for a Cy Young again, especially um, now after the second Tommy John. Yeah, me. Yeah, but still, um, un yeah. unreal, dude, unreal. Uh, we got okay. We got to move on. We're starting to sound like Ben Verlander going to 2023. Garrett Cole. Yeah. Finally, the year he won is Cy Young, right? I mean, had a number of good seasons before that. He finally got it. Garrett Cole. Oh, oh, by the way, last year, like I said, S tier, you agree with Verlander S tier? Yes. Okay. This season for me, Garrett Cole, uh, maybe maybe I'll get some hate here, right, from the Yankee fan, but I think this is A tier. 165 ERA plus, 2.63 ERA. A good season, 209 innings pitch, led the league. Honestly, kind of crazy that that like was 20 innings pitch more than the league leader two years before that. So it does show the volume that he was putting up relative to his era. Uh, league leading hits per nine, always love to see that. And 11th in uh, MVP voting for a Yankees team that didn't make the playoffs. Pretty impressive oh, overall. Yeah, and I, I will throw this out there as a rebuttal to maybe flirt this into S tier is that he won the award unanimously while easily leading in innings and having the best DRA. Like it got to, like it was funny because so like Cole had a really strong second half as the Yankees were kind of falling apart. But at around like July, 
it was a wide open race. Like it was, it was, it was wide open in the sense that Cole was the clear favorite, but it was like, okay, if Cole's like two bad starts, like Kevin Gosman's going to overtake him. Exactly. Sonny, Sonny Gray, like Luis Castillo, Kyle Bradish, like even like Felix Bautista was so crazy this year that like before he got hurt, like there was a, you, right. There was, it, it could have been like an argument. Exactly. Like Chris, Chris Martin was also in real this year, weirdly, but like Garrett Cole was so easily the best pitcher in baseball compared to his peers. Like, and it was funny. Cause I feel like in the off season, obviously people are going to, a few people are going to disagree. But I felt like it was one of the first times in a bit where we had a consensus where I think I think everyone was like, yeah, Garrett Cole's the best pitcher in baseball. Like I uh, agree with that. I, I almost would chalk that up a little bit to a lack of elite elite competition. And I think that that yes. comes back to me of like the 165 ERA plus. I know a lot of people, you can't put all of your eggs into one stat. ERA, yes. war, wins, if you're that of that mind, uh, total strikeouts, all these things. ERA, they, they're all like combined into an overall image. But to me, 165 ERA plus it's not even as good as you know Verlander's season that we were rating a tier that had significantly more innings. That's fair. Two, That's over, fair. Yeah, 20, ten more innings, fifteen more innings, or whatever it was. Um, on top of that, too, like again, I'm I'm not faulting the quality of this year, but it actually was his lowest K per nine since he went lowest K per nine since he went to the Astros as a twenty seven. That's really fun. So, yeah, again, not saying that the quality of the overall starts were worse, but he was a lot less dominant. Maybe that ended up like helping him in some weird way. Uh, you know, helping him uh, throw more innings by not having to cut through as many guys with strikeouts. But for that reason, I can't give it above an A tier. I will give it an A tier, though. You know, I mean, I'm not going to be one of those people who's going to be contrarian and be like, oh, the Yankees. He gets a yeah. B tier. I have a quick, qu- just qu- quick question yeah. about Garrett Cole, because I, I think it's really interesting looking at his career, because he's really only had like, since he was since since he was 24 years old. So like after he made his first All-Star team, he's basically been good every amazing every season outside of like maybe one or two yeah um what is how likely would you say garrett cole's hall of fame chances are like out of 10 yeah okay out of 10 i like that out of 10 i'd say right now he has a i'm gonna say a six out of 10 you're oh that's, that's a lot why. lower than i thought this is why so we have to look at the changing way that people view hall of fame voting for pitchers right so that's going to be significant in anybody who's going to say, oh, he's going to be a Hall of Famer is that people are going to change their perspective on that. And eventually they're going to understand that guys who don't throw the most innings, because especially coming off of a Tommy John surgery or not Tommy John surgery, I'm sorry, but a major arm injury that's going to limit his innings this season. Uh, and he's getting older now. He's you know 33 this season. He's going to be 34 next season. I don't see him eclipsing 3000 innings. Um, at that point, I don't know if I necessarily even see him, especially with his diminishing strikeout rate, eclipsing 3,000 strikeouts. Mm-hmm. Do I think that p- people in the Hall of Fame community are going to start adapting to? Sorry. Do I think that? Do I think that people in the Hall of Fame community are going to start adapting to pitchers throwing less innings with less strikeouts? Yes, I do. However, I also don't think he's going to get to 200 wins. Even if we see a 25 to 30, even let's say ridiculously 40% shift in the perspective of Hall of Fame voters, I still don't think he necessarily is a guarantee at the rate that he is right now if he does this for another two or three seasons of getting in. So I I just want to throw, just throw something out there. Garrett Cole is still only 33 years old. Like, so like there is, especially with, you know, like Garrett Cole's, I mean, you you are a pitcher. Garrett Cole's yeah. mechanic, mechanics and everything. They're pretty flawless. Yeah. Gorgeous. And, you know, like a guy who's really never had any serious injury issues, at least in recent times. Yeah. Like, I feel like. Do you think he's able... going to be a Verlander in that respect? Because like, Verlander is the archetype but... in some respect of like a guy who throws really hard yet has managed to stay relatively healthy. And I, well, that's kind of what I was going to throw out there is I feel like Garrett Cole could age well because there is a bit like, like you said, I think last year kind of transitioning less from the I'm going to overpower everyone because it stopped working as well. So mm-hmm. like he was more just, you know, pitching. I hate that. Yeah, phrase. But yeah, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Where I feel like his game could age well because he's just so flawless mechanically. And it's, you know, like it's 
it's not it's not as wild as other guys and he still right. has time like you know like he's he's a whole he's i mean he's younger than like he's younger than like zach wheeler and they're around the same age actually but still like he's i feel like so right now he's 32 33 my bad and he's at 2100 strikeouts and 145 wins i think he could get i think 3000 is i think he'll get the 3000 i'll just agree with you that the wins are just weird because you know wins are just down but i would i would rate it more of a seven or eight out of ten especially okay. if you, especially finish his career if he finishes his career out like hot in the yankees yeah i mean dude I, i'll say Six out of ten means I do believe it's likely. So I mean, yeah. I, I believe he's going to get the three thousand strikeouts and all of those things. The that's the only real thing that's like holding it back for me is just first of all, yeah, is he going to age well? Because he is a power pitcher, like you said, he's making some transitions from that. I'd love to see him use. Funny enough, he could end up like going back to the future and using more of a sinker, like from his days with the Pirates and mm -hmm. mixing that in there and things of that nature. But, um, honestly, the thing that's just a little worrying to me is almost like his. Felix Hernandez or Felix Hernandez esque workload relative to his era. He's thrown so many innings from such an early age. He first uh, made his big league debut in at uh, age 22. And since then he's thrown over 200 innings close to every season. Uh, and then of course the abridged 2020 season and then a couple other ones where he had some other like minor mm -hmm. injury issues. How does that age on his arm, especially coming as a guy who's those 95 to 98? I don't know. We're already seeing a little bit of uh, some injury issues this season. Again, it's not it's not us, you know, Tommy John or anything yet. I'm hopeful that it doesn't turn into that because you know, arm injuries with the Yankees can like go absolutely off the rails so quickly. Um, um, but, throw but yeah. something out there. Throw something out there. Um, right now, Garrett Cole's the same age. I know it's a weird pitcher comparison, but I think it'll make sense. He's the same age that Zach Greinke was when Greinke joined the Diamondbacks. That's interesting. That's and actually crazy. <laughs> and and Granky, um, when after he joined the Diamondbacks, added a thousand, eleven hundred more strikeouts in his career, and he's just shy of two thousand. By That's the way, three thousand, three thousand. Have crazy. you heard that he's working out in the Diamondbacks spring training no, facility? I actually didn't hear that. He is, yeah, right now he's working out the Diamondbacks uh, spring training facility, and basically saying like, oh, like I'm considering whether I want to come back or not. And apparently, people who've been around there, including some minor leaguers who are like rehabbing and things of that nature. I uh, have said that like, oh, he still has a major league like change up. Like, I think he could actually be decent for a team. I need that. I need that. So I bad. need 3000 strikeouts for Zach Greinke. Please that's make gonna it be, happen. That's that's it's gonna make the movie Mr. 3000. But Dude, um, exactly. But no, but but still, like, I would think like, do you think Cole ages as well as Zach Greinke? Like, I think that's realistic, right? I, I don't. The thing is, this is what's so bizarre about somebody like Zach Greinke. I almost don't it's even so weird. I don't even know like <laughs> who you could comp him with because 35 years old, he had a 154 ERA plus, right? But this is the weird thing about Zach Greinke is that who he was in 2019 was not even close to who he was in 2015. He went from being, in at different eras of his career, he went from being the archetype of Nolan Ryan to being the archetype of Greg Maddox. Like, he literally has moved all along, and it's all intentional, right? He throws 88 miles an hour, 89 miles an hour, not necessarily because that's as fast as he can throw, because that's what he thinks he's going to be effective at. Yeah, Derek, like he he can he is able to adapt because of that. It comes with really extreme weird intelligence. I don't see Garrett Cole. I'm not saying he's stupid. I mean, he's obviously a very smart individual. He always comes across as very, to me, very intelligent and understanding, especially of like the baseball sphere. But do I see him throwing 89 miles an hour and being effective at 39 years old? Probably not. I think he'd have to stay in the power pitcher mold. I think if he can be semi similar to Verlander, then it's a lock. Like, that's the thing. I, I think he's close. Yeah. Six out of 10, I think he's pretty close. But at the end of the day, if he doesn't hit 3,000, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting conversation, especially with Hall of Fame voters. Like, who, again, that's a huge other leg to this whenever we're having these conversations is I think he should be a Hall of Famer. I think that when he retires, he probably should be a Hall of Famer. Yeah, you're more looking at it from a voting perspective. I get he, it, yeah. They're all, like, you know, kind yeah, of well, kind I mean of dumb. <laughs> I mean, I'm. I mean, hey, like, I, I mean, to me, I, I feel like there's like been talks about Granky in the Hall of Fame. Like, I know I, that's ridiculous. I feel like that's a layup. Dude, like, I think it's. I, I think. I think similar to like the Yachty thing. Like, yeah. Like, exactly. Yeah. Yachty Molina's a Hall of Famer. Like, 
like you know like <laughs> exactly dude dude okay so so i have to um i'm actually going to an angels yankees yeah game yeah yeah with my yeah. girlfriend so i actually got a scoot here pretty soon but i want to ask one more question that we can uh kind of ponder back and forth here along the yachty hall of fame uh lines before we go which yeah. is that I was looking at the. This might have been better in the early part, but I'm gonna throw it out there. I was looking at Salvador Perez and the season oh, he's having no. this season. He's having the best season of his career by far, obviously. But hitting um, wise, yes. Hit, hitting wise and fielding wise, he actually is decent oh, yes, fielding yes, wise yes. this season for the first time. Do you think that Salvador Perez, if he reaches 300 home runs for his career and 40 B WAR, is a Hall of Famer as a catcher? Dude, this. The, the thing is like. It's like weirdly, it's like going yeah. Like the answer is going to be yes because I as of a feeling, I just don't think it that should be the case. You don't think uh, Salvador Perez is a Hall of Famer? No, I just I I just feel like he wasn't. Uh, okay, like this this Salvador Perez is the one that's is is the most polar is like weirdly the most represents the polarization in baseball. Yeah. <laughs> Like he has five gold gloves, but like, and it, like it, they're kind of like Jeter gold gloves. Yeah, G- they're Jeter gold gloves for sure. But and at the same time, he was an awesome power hitter. But like, I mean, he's re- he's not like an insane overall for a catcher. He's really good hitter, but not yeah. like he's still like a slightly above average overall hitter. Like I think, you know, like yeah. I, I don't know. I just this feel is... like one, I, I don't think he's going to maintain what he's doing right now. I mean, I just feel like with no. his approach, it would be kind of hard, but I, I give him all the props in the world for fixing, you know, his defensive issues with the framing. And it's so, so funny because people always said over the years that like Salvi's a good, good defender. Like, who cares about framing? But like, yeah, Salvi, Salvi drilled framing all offseason. Exactly. So clearly, he the, cared. Cl- clearly, the Royals were worried about how bad he was at it. Yes. But I just I just feel like that if he's a Hall of Famer, a lot of guys are Hall of Famer. This and okay, so this is my only point here, all right? So w- this question is is he going to be a Hall of Famer versus should he be a Hall of Famer? He now, he's going to be. Yeah, I think he's going to be. <laughs> he's going to be. Now, I think my argument is coming from a different perspective, which is I think it's actually unfair the standards that most catchers are held to relative to the hardness of their position. So if okay. we compare him to historical comps, I don't think he should be, right? No. Like Jorge Posada is not a Hall of Famer. If Jorge Posada is exactly. a Hall of Famer, then Salvador Perez should not yes. be a Hall of Famer. Brian McCann is not a Hall of Famer. If Brian McCann is not a Hall of Famer, Salvador Perez probably shouldn't be a Hall of Famer, right? Yes. However, if Salvador Perez were to reach 300 career home runs, he could very quickly pass Gary Carter and Ivan Rodriguez for uh, their spots on the list and be top seven in home runs ever. Oh, God. When was it ever stated that catchers need to be held to the same standard as other guys do? Jorge Posada, in my opinion, is an easy, easy Hall of Famer. I don't understand why he's not in. He was one of the best hitting catchers of his generation, if not the best hitting catcher over the period that he played, aside from Avon Rodriguez. And maybe you can make an argument that prime Brian McCann was a little better. 300 home runs from a backstop. And again, a lot of it's going to come down to your conceptualization of war, right? 40 career war on the b-war side is top 25 ever if you if i told you anybody was top 25 in anything out of players with you know five thousand plus players yes. that position two thousand plus players you'd say that's hall of fame easy like at top 25 that means there's only 24 guys better than them however if you look at his f war we're talking about 17 f war right now what he currently has so he has a chance more at 20 that wouldn't even be you know top 200 i don't think yeah, so that part just, of that's going to be the conceptualization of what you look at from that perspective. However, I, I more believe in a loose Hall of Fame, uh, looser interpretation of Hall of Fame when it comes to catchers. That position is just so hard that anybody that manages to excel to that level, I think, needs to be rewarded disproportionate to what they currently have been. Uh, mm-hmm. Even even somebody like uh, Ted Simmons, for example, right? 222 home runs. He played in almost 2,000 games. He was so good for so long, right? I mean... Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's more my perspective on it. I, I'm not. I don't think Russell Martin should be a Hall of Famer. I'll say that, and he has a little bit better of, any, of a career of war than Salvi even does now. So it definitely that, is a little bit of a Homer argument, but like, because like I think that's that's my problem with it. I feel like is if you think Salvi's a Hall of Famer, 
that's fine. It's just like you have to think a lot of other guys are Hall of Famers. Too. Exactly. And I I do think the catchers and, and you do like against. Yeah, like I think that's something you'd be consistent with that like take because I, I feel like we're at a point where we kind of realize that a lot of award voting can be cooked. I feel like a lot of us realize that Derek Jeter wasn't a great defender, for example. Right. Despite the despite the gold gloves. And I feel like you can watch Salvi Perez and be, realize, okay, like maybe this guy isn't the greatest backstop ever, ever defensively while having, you know, like good hitting numbers. But for example, like JT, OBP. Ramuto, like JT Ramuto has better like numbers than him. And I think JT Ramuto should be considered a Hall of Fame catcher as well. I, when he retires, I think he should be. Will he be? I don't know. I'm not necessarily convinced yeah, of that. I will say this though. Catcher is definitely underrepresented in the Hall of Fame. See, and that's kind of what my perspective is too. To me, it is a completely ridiculous, misunderstood crime that Jorge Posada, and I'm not a, I'm no big Yankee fan, all right? I've never been a big Yankee <laughs> fan. But to me, that is ridiculous that he's not in the Hall of Fame when you look at his numbers. Dude, 273, 374, 474 for a catcher over 17 years, 275 mm -hmm. home runs. That's top 15 all time for a catcher. 379 doubles over 1,500 career hits, over 1,000 RBIs, 121 OPS plus for his career as a catcher. Over 40 yeah. career war. I don't understand what was missing. I, I almost feel like the Yankees suffer from, um, like, uh, what would you call it? Like a uh, voter fatigue when it comes to their Hall of Fame members. Like, in a, yeah, because like, because I feel like a lot of guys had like for had like interesting arguments, but like never really got the love. Exactly, so, Bernie Williams, for example, is a great yeah, example. Yeah, exactly. Like, like his, yeah, but like I, I just feel like, for example, I feel like, I feel like Joe Maurer sets an interesting precedent for catchers. Like, I think Joe Maurer getting into the Hall of Fame easily makes it so that i feel like buster posey gets in really easily yes which I, yeah like i feel like i think like he was like another weird guy because it's like oh like he really didn't have a long career at all like yes but i, but I think it's when, when you look at buster posey i think it's like an easy hall of famer right seriously but i mean wower only had four uh, three points on his ops plus for his career over posada for example so it's like yes dude Come and on, Maurer, man. and even though Maurer was a good defensive catcher, he played he first base for first a lot game. of his career. Yeah, exactly. Um, Posey only had eight points on Jorge Posada for his career. Also heard him, I think, that Mike Piazza was around that time. And Mike Piazza is unequivocally the best overall hitting catcher. I don't think that's really a conversation at all. Yeah, 143 for his career. Yeah. 143 yeah. OPS plus. Actually yeah. ridiculous. Oh, I do want to say one thing about Piazza that I think is bizarre. In his entire 16-year career, he had eight triples. He averaged 0. 0.5 triples a season. Dude. That's actually like I, I didn't even know that. That's 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 insane. But ridiculous uh, ridiculous regardless. You know what? At, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I want to see catcher be more represented. Yeah, but you know what? That I, was I think it's fair. That wasn't even our conversation that we were having overall. I really enjoyed talking about these uh, these AL Cy Young winners. I think that we're pretty much in agreement on most of the decisions, right? If we, we want to go over yeah. them real quick. Uh, we had Felix in S tier for 2010. Verlander in 2011 was an S tier for both of us. 2012, David Price, B tier. 2013, Mad Max, B tier. 2014, Kluber, A tier. 2015, Keiko, B tier. Porcello, my favorite pitcher. My favorite campaign of all time, C tier in yes, 2016. Coy Kluber actually managing to bring the standard up a bit to S tier in 2017. And then, in my opinion, we had a back to backer, Snell with an S tier in 2018. Uh, 2019, JV, A tier, bordering on S tier. I think I'm comfortable leaving it in A tier, to be honest, relative to some of the other so. seasons, even that JV had himself. Uh, Bieber, uh, Justin Bieber. 2020 yeah, B, B, yeah, B tier. <laughs> uh, B tier. 2021 Robbie Ray. It's going to be a back-to-back -back, uh, pop stars essentially winning. Justin Bieber and Robbie Ray. Uh, but okay. <laughs> 2021 obviously B tier for that. Uh, 2022 JV S tier and then finishing off 2023 Garrett Cole. I'm going to say A tier. And what, what would you lock in? I'll, I'll lock in A tier after your after your argument. Yeah, yeah. I'll be, again, I, it's easy to be a homer in that respect. I definitely homered a bit for Verlander just because yeah, he no, was you're so allowed to. That's the goat. Exactly. But at the end of the day, I, I think they're going to end up being together in the Hall of Fame. Former teammates, 
I think yeah. we'll eventually be in the well, same Well, Verlander's lock. A, a lock lock. But. Oh, yeah. uh, Verlander's inner circle lock, honestly. So yeah, should inner circle. So should be uh, Zach Greinke. But you know what? Verlander, we unequivocally can say, is going to get yeah. in first ballot. All righty. Yes. All right, dude. It was great talking to you. I enjoyed this podcast. Obviously, we have to come up with a new concept for next week's podcast, right? Oh, yeah, dude. We, we, we got to be more creative. Yeah, we're going to rack our brains. All right, dude. It was great talking to you. I'll talk to you next week. Talk to you next week. See you. Hope you guys enjoyed.